We are many things, but one of the things we are is a series of decisions. When you choose one thing, you reject everything else, G.K. Chesterton said. Every moment, life lays before you a series of options in matters that go from the banal to the transcendent. What will you have for breakfast? What will you wear to work or to class? What will you study in college? Will you accept that job offer or that marriage proposal? Our lives are a series of forking paths, and every choice we make adds a layer to our being. It is, among other things, that series of decisions that makes me who I am. Asla chose to leave home at an early age, to attend art school, to be a painter. Each decision we make tears us in two, hence the expression, I am torn. I am torn between pancakes and waffles. I am torn between engineering and philosophy. At the forking paths of each of those decisions, we could imagine an alternate version of Asla, and the possibilities are infinite. What if we could see those alternate versions of ourselves? When I was 16 years old, my parents decided that we as a family would move to the United States. I often wonder what would I be like now if that option had not existed. Every time I visit my birthplace, I play with the idea that any time I might run into that other self, the version of me that stayed and was faced with a different series of choices. Would I even recognize myself? Asla chose to become a Catholic. It was his faith, he claims, that allowed him to stop drinking. But there's another Asla who lives in Björkman. He's also a painter, but he's not a Catholic, and he still drinks. Asla has painted a cross, a St. Andrew's cross, as his neighbor Oslake points out. The cross depicts the intersection of two paths. Traditionally, the cross with a capital C is interpreted as the point at which the human and the divine connect. Asla's painting is both simple and complex. Maybe there are no simple things, after all. Maybe all we ever see is the tip of the iceberg. Everything is a symbol of itself. How does time fit into the picture? Whenever I visited my birthplace, I felt my other self was just around the corner, or maybe even following me. But I also saw my old self in the familiar places I visited. A child buying chocolate from a candy store. A teenager catching the bus downtown. The playgrounds of public squares were particularly important to me. I could see myself, as a child, enjoying the slides and the swings. The couple that Asla sees in the playground seems like a regular couple at first, but he eventually questions whether they were real or part of a memory. Was that Asla himself and his girlfriend years ago? The past is never dead. It's not even past, as William Faulkner put it. Sometimes an object represents the intersection of present and past. I look at a book, a souvenir, a watch, and that's all it takes for the past to come alive in the present moment. The most seemingly unimportant object all of a sudden becomes a doorway to the past, or the portal through which the past intrudes upon the present. In the journey of our life, we encounter roads that diverge and roads that intersect. Sometimes what was and what might have been haunt us, keep us awake, make it difficult for us to stay in the moment, that elusive now that holds eternity. Would there be art, however, without those moments of despair? It's in the hopelessness and despair, Asla says, in the darkness that God is closest to us. We have heard this before in that story about footprints in the sand. Asla prays himself to sleep. He thinks of Meister Eckhart and prays the rosary to put to rest the images and the voices of the past that past that never stops knocking, that endless river of words, that series of decisions that made us who we are. If you drive late at night in the company of a dog, you may start remembering things. The past is an old friend that shows up uninvited. There should be a program 
an app, as they are called these days, to measure how much time a given person spends reliving episodes from his or her past. Asla recalls the moment he and his sister disobeyed their parents. They were not supposed to go too far away from their house. They were not supposed to go down to the water. They were not supposed to talk to strangers. There is a folktale element to this episode which made me think of Hansel and Gretel and to the disturbing encounter with the bald man that Asla remembers at the end of the day which has something of little Red Riding Hood to it. Siblings must stay together. Beware of the bad wolf. When I was a teenager, my family and I would go camping at a beach town during the summer. I'll never forget the day I thought I had lost my brother. I was mad at him for some reason, so during our daily walk from the camping site to the shore, I walked fast, making him fall behind. At one point I looked back, and my brother had vanished. There was no place where he could be hiding, and I felt that if he had taken a different route, I would have noticed. I looked around, retraced my steps, but my brother was nowhere to be found. Terrified, I ran back to the camping site. My parents were going to kill me, but I needed to tell them that I had lost my brother. When I got back to our camp, out of breath and with my heart beating like a hammer on my chest, I saw my brother sitting there with my parents. I have never experienced that type of relief again. When their mother finds Asla and his sister after she thought something might have happened to them, she is so happy to see them that she forgets to scold them. It is one of those moments in which the possibility of having lost something or someone we cherish makes us realize the true value of that thing or that person. You don't know what you've got till it's gone, as the popular saying goes. What follows once we find what we thought was lost is absolute thanksgiving. Asla prays himself to sleep. There are many ways to pray. Expressing gratitude is one of them. Giving thanks each day for the meals we enjoyed, the people we met, the lessons we learned, the moments of joy that gave us strength, the moments of tribulation that helped us become better versions of ourselves. Asla experiences a moment of thanksgiving when he finally sits down to have dinner in the company of his neighbor, Oslik, in silence. Without hunger, without thirst, we would not know the pleasure of fulfillment. Without despair, we would not know the ecstasy of joy. Without noise, we would not know the bliss of silence, and it is in that silence that God speaks most clearly. There is a reason why some members of religious orders choose silence and solitude. This seems like penance, but in a way it is just the opposite. To attain everything, one must renounce everything. And yet, things are important. Is that the reason for all these details, this desire to leave nothing out? The implication is that nothing is irrelevant. Everything that exists is necessary by virtue of its very existence. Think of the intricately, beautifully complex mechanism of a wristwatch. The pieces look so tiny so insignificant, and yet taking out a single one of those pieces will result in malfunction. A ticking clock is one of the most poetic objects on earth, but one must not forget that time does not really exist. By far the most awesome and fearful human invention, time is scaffolding. It is a grid. It is the frame around this immense painting of life. Here is G.K. Chesterton once again. Art is limitation. The essence of every picture is the frame. There are no periods because our experience of life, whether we realize it or not, is an uninterrupted flow. We go through different phases and each one adds layers to our personality. Each one represents another step in the process of defining ourselves. As a teenager, Asla wants to escape, or to become independent, or both. What is it ultimately that makes so many of us want to escape the world of our parents at that age? The feeling of not being understood? Disappointment? A type of built-in mechanism that pushes us into adulthood as we become functioning members of society? 
there must be a certain pride in having a place of one's own. I don't know, because this is something I have never experienced. I did make a point at the age of 18 of traveling back to my birthplace by myself. It felt great to be on my own, to make my own decisions, to experience a kind of independence, but there was also much anxiety involved. The process of self-individuation involves the cutting of a second umbilical cord. Asla also wants to sever the ties with the national church, another way in which he seeks to solidify his own identity. Maybe one of the things that draws us to coming-of-age stories is the fact that these texts are developing before our eyes. The characters grow, they become, but so does the text itself. This is always the case, of course, but it is more evident in stories that trace a character's development and individuation. This is another reason why there are no periods. Life is flux, so the novel must be flux. One cannot go down twice to the same river. The river is not the same, but most importantly, one is not the same. I let the novel take me where it will. I abandon all expectations, all prejudices, all hope. I abandon myself as a reader and let the river carry me. It was not like that at first. Initially, I thought of Samuel Beckett. Men locked in a room, writing themselves into entropy, or as a way to fight entropy, because the text is all that exists. We write ourselves into a spiral of words. We keep coming back to the same place, but at different levels. At the end of the day, what matters is whether the spiral is moving downward or upward. Is that the main difference between Fossa and Beckett? I don't have to agree with an author to enjoy his or her works. Beckett is a great example of an author whose philosophy does not speak to me, but who has given me great pleasure. Fossa is an entirely different experience for me. I can see where he is going. I can walk next to him. Asla's mother seems to be obsessed with his hair. Long hair becomes such an important part of his identity that he carries it into his adult life. When I was a teenager, I wanted to have long hair, but that would have been unthinkable. It was not even an option. Why did I have that desire? What did it mean to me, or what message did I hope it would convey? Was it a sign of rebellion? A desire to imitate the rock stars I venerated? Like Asla, I wanted to play the guitar. My parents bought me one and paid for my guitar lessons. Like Asla, I did not get far. Asla says at one point that painting is just something he does, but the reader can tell there is more to it than that. They say if one can live without writing, then one should not write. By extension, this means that if one can live without creating, one should not create. Is this true? I get the feeling, in any case, that Asla cannot live without painting. Once a concept takes hold of him, he must paint it away, as he puts it, and no matter what the subject is, he is ultimately painting light. Our experience of darkness helps us to appreciate light. Without contraries is no progression, William Blake said. This is a paradox, and so is the cross. To pray is to talk to God. That was the first definition of prayer I was taught. As a basic definition, it works, but with the years I polished it a bit and came up with something more precise and hopefully more accurate. To pray is to communicate with God. To communicate instead of to talk, because prayer often transcends words. To communicate with instead of to talk to, because prayer is never a one-sided activity. Asla believes that a good picture is a gift and the prayer of gratitude. Art can be prayer. Work can be prayer. The desire to pray continuously is a central theme in the 19th century Russian spiritual classic The Way of a Pilgrim, which stresses the importance of what is known as the Jesus Prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me. This is a mantra for Asla, and it is with this prayer that he goes to sleep every day. Septology is of course a novel, but it would be more accurate to describe it as a prayer. Augustine's Confessions present a similar case, 
The book is often described as the first autobiography, but it is primarily a prayer. In both cases, we are allowed to hear what is ultimately meant for God's ears. Hence the strange, personal, even difficult style of both of these works, the twists and turns, the jolts we experience as readers. A question I've always had is, how can painters, sculptors, visual artists bear to part with their creations? I write a short story, a poem, a novel. In a second, I can copy the file and share it with someone. In a few minutes, I can print copies of my work. There's no sense of loss. Art may also be copied, of course, but the situation is entirely different. From my perspective, letting go seems like the most difficult part of creating a work of art. Asta is attached to the St. Andrew's Cross painting that lies at the center of the novel. He repeats that he does not want Oslake to have it. It is so close to his heart that letting go of it might be the equivalent of losing a part of himself, a vital one. I can relate to this, even if I am not an artist, because I also have a difficult time letting go. I have books I will never read again, many that I will never even read for the first time because there is just not enough time, films I will never watch again, albums I will never listen to again. Why is it so difficult for me to let them go, to give others the opportunity to enjoy them? I feel the need to hold on to most things that have been a part of my life. Some months ago, the first TV set my family bought when we moved to the US stopped working. I did let go of that, but not without taking a picture of it first. In theory, I understand that I won't be able to take anything with me when I pass away, but between theory and practice, there is an abyss. When I was a teenager, I painted a ceramic figure of Michelangelo's David. For some reason I'll never understand, I decided to give it to my doctor. It was one of the best ceramic figures I have ever painted, in a style that imitated metal. Every now and then that David crosses my mind. I often wonder whether my doctor still has it. But then I think that if she does, perhaps she remembers me. So that in a way, because that piece of art is an extension of me, I am in a sense present in a faraway place, on a shelf, in a room, in the city where I was born. And that gives me comfort. And I understand. Listen to this. God is so close that we don't notice him and so far away that we don't notice him for that reason either. That makes me think of that old saying, God is a circle whose center is everywhere and whose circumference is nowhere. That's all. I wonder at what point it was that I found it impossible to continue to think of myself as an individual self. It would be easy to say that the split occurred when I was forced to leave my birthplace. That is not true. Even before I left my country, I was conscious of a duality, a split in my existence. Maybe this is something that should be embraced. After all, isn't a human being a walking contradiction, in a sense? We cease to be scared of monsters when we realize that we, these animal-angel hybrids we call humans are the most fascinating and awe-inspiring monsters anyone could have imagined or dreamed. Asla hears from his friend Sikva that there is another Asla who is also a painter. What would you do in Asla's situation? Would you want to meet that other version of yourself? Many famous stories suggest that that is not a good idea. Edgar Allan Poe's William Wilson Robert Louis Stevenson's Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, Fyodor Dostoevsky's The Double, Vladimir Nabokov's Despair, sort of. Sometimes curiosity defeats caution, and that is why doppelganger stories are still convincing. A voice in my head tells me it is not a good idea to meet that other version of myself. The very idea that there is another version of me living a life over which I have no control is repellent but it is also fascinating. No logical argument would keep me from trying to meet myself. It is also from Sigva that Asta hears about literature. Two names are mentioned, Beckett and Traku. Isn't the act of reading a type of unfolding too? Don't novels allow us to live other lives? As I read about Asta, I become Asta. 
I experience his life and his struggles firsthand. A book opens like a door that leads to a room full of doors, and all of those doors lead to more rooms full of doors. Every book, good or bad, is the portal to a parallel universe. Suddenly, I encounter the words of Meister Eckhart in German. Gott ist nichts, was man in Worte fassen kann. God is not something that can be put into words. Words, words, words. The great foes of reality, Joseph Conrad called them. Like most of the things we create, they are imperfect, and yet we have built entire worlds with them. They both connect us to God and separate us from Him, Fossa writes. Isn't this a given with words, especially when one considers that there are so many layers of meaning to each of them? Eckhart said, we must not mistake God for our concept of God. Augustine said, if you understand, it is not God. Does that mean we should shut up? Of course not. In any case, even if we should, we would not be able to. We are human. We do language. We are language. Asta's fear of words becomes evident when he is asked to read a text in class. An apparently simple task leads to a panic attack, and as I read this passage, I could not believe what I was reading, because the exact same thing happened to me during a philosophy class my second semester of college. It felt as if the English language were destroying me, shaking me to the core as it passed through me. I had to stop, and after class the professor approached me and promised me she would never ask me to read again. A word is an approximation. Even if I say dog, I can never hope to convey the reality that I am trying to express. If I say God, my attempt to express what I mean becomes almost laughable. But I still say God, because we work with what we have, and because that word by itself is a form of prayer. Because that word fills me with something I do not understand, something that is beyond words, as everything is, strictly speaking, beyond words. Because I know what I am saying. I know what I mean. Because even though words are problematic, most of the time we understand each other. And that is a miracle. Someone asks me, what is the book about? It's about intersections, I say. It's about paths that converge. If you put the books of the three-volume edition next to each other, you see the St. Andrew's Cross. Two lives meet. They are the same and not the same life. Asla and Asla, yes, but also Asla and Alles. Asla and any of the other characters whose paths cross in the story. Think about a very special person in your life. There was a point in time at which your paths crossed. Isn't it fascinating to consider where the paths were going before the meeting took place? How close were the two paths to meeting before they finally did? I thought about this many years ago. Sometime later, I saw it exactly as I had imagined it in the film The Adjustment Bureau, which is based on a short story by Philip K. Dick. Consider all that has to happen in order for two people to meet. The chain of events is staggering. Alter one factor, and the meeting may never take place. Seen in that light, the meeting of two people becomes a miracle. A picture says something, but not what it wants to say. Does the same go for words? A picture is spirit, matter plus soul. Because pictures have a spirit, painting can be compared to praying. Asla says the pictures he paints are prayer and confession and penance all at once. He also points out that all good art finds its way to the same place. I feel that art is a way to reach the transcendent. The same could be said of spirituality, even though art and spirituality are not the same thing and have different purposes. If I weren't a spiritual person, I would probably try to use art as a channel to reach the transcendent. If all good art ultimately leads to the same place, does that mean that all good art comes from the same place? Is one of the purposes of art to return home? 
I will quote G.K. Chesterton a third time. There are two ways of getting home, and one of them is to stay there. The other is to walk round the whole world till we come back to the same place. When I hear this, I cannot help thinking of one of the most inspiring works of art I have seen, The Return of the Prodigal Son by Rembrandt. And when I think of Rembrandt's painting, I cannot help thinking of the ending of Andrei Tarkovsky's Solyaris. If all good art comes from the same place, then there is a unifying element to all good art. Maybe it is true that great artists tap into the same source. Is this Asla's problem, the reason why he keeps saying that he cannot paint anymore? There is another connection with Beckett here, those narrators who are aware of the inadequacy of words and who cannot stop producing them, as if verbal expression were an irrepressible human urge. I remember the concluding words of the unnameable. You must go on. I can't go on. I'll go on. It may be simply a matter of embracing that unavoidable feeling of inadequacy. Try again. Fail again. Fail better, as Beckett said elsewhere. That, too, is a paradox. And here is another one. God isn't anything. He is a dark, shining nothingness. A nothing. A not. And at the same time, he is also in everything that is. He is being, a distance that is also closeness. Like Chesterton, like Kierkegaard, like Eckhart, Fosse understands that the best way to speak about the transcendent is through paradox. For the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. As Asta recalls his adolescence and the moment he met the other Asta, the other Asta lies in a hospital bed, gravely ill. Throughout the novel we have this juxtaposition of memory and agony, these parallel stories about remembering and suffering. Penance, purification, passion. Septology is the story of a passion. By etymology, passion means suffering. The river keeps flowing. I let the words carry me. A critic described it as a novel in one sentence, but that's not what it is. There is not a single period, so this is not a sentence, but the fragment of a sentence, because life is flux. Something comes before page 1, something comes after page 197 of the third volume. It has no beginning or ending, because this is, among other things, a prayer, and one should pray ceaselessly. Fossa was awarded the Nobel Prize for his innovative plays and prose which give voice to the unsayable. What would Wittgenstein have said? Wittgenstein, who wrote, what can be said at all can be said clearly, and whereof one cannot speak, thereof one must be silent. And the limits of my language mean the limits of my world. Every now and then an author, an artist, tries to take us beyond our limitations. This is, of course, impossible, but it's the thought that counts. Language will miss the mark. The author understands that, but he or she will still try. We will not grasp the truth in its totality, but we may reach a better understanding of it, and that's good enough. For now we see through a glass, darkly, but then face to face. Seven deadly sins seven virtues, seven joys, seven sorrows, seven sacraments, seven days. The number seven is a line in heaven that suddenly descends to earth. It happens here, on earth, this place of light and darkness, laughter and tears, hope and despair. This beautifully awful, awfully beautiful place where one day someone tells you there's another person who bears your name and who resembles you. This person never studied literature, never became a professor, never launched a YouTube channel, never developed an interest in the Nobel Prize in Literature, never read Septology. Still, you become friends with this other you, and in the end it makes sense that there are two of you, as if God had wanted to make sure that one of you would go on. Yes, it makes sense. Maybe everything does, 
seen from the right perspective. We're just on the wrong side of the tapestry. What we do here, in our messy ways, looks beautiful on the other side. And sometimes it even looks beautiful here. The important thing is to keep going, keep writing, keep painting, keep creating, even if nothing makes much sense, especially when nothing makes much sense. Let the river of words carry you. Become one with it. It all begins and ends with the word. What more will you say? It took you a little over seven days to read this text. You feel that you are a part of it. If you go to the kitchen and find Asla there, sitting at the table with a cup of coffee, you will not be surprised at all, because it is through words that we create universes. These words accompanied you for a week, and as you immersed yourself in the text, you felt that something was happening to the world around you. A great book illuminates the world, enriches it. Adolfo Bioy Casares said that to write was to add a room to the house of life. To read is to inhabit those rooms that have been created for us. I like this room, so much that I find it hard to leave it. But the end of the book marks the beginning of life, and now life looks different, the world looks brighter, because something amazing has been added to it. And I can go back to the room any time I want. All I need to do is to open the door, to open the book. On Thursday, October 5th, I woke up early and waited for the announcement from the Swedish Academy. It was exactly 20 years ago that I decided that I would read at least one book by every winner of the Nobel Prize in Literature. As soon as I heard the name Jon Fosse, I went to my library account and placed holds on the three volumes of the English translation of Septology. 23 days later, I finished reading it. Then I sat down and started to write.